You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit GVOL.io. That's G V O L dot I O. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again for the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the Options Insider Radio Network, where we go beyond the traditional world of equity and index options and explore what's going on. In the world of crypto, it could be the spot, the futures, indeed the options, the volume, the volatility, the skew, all that good stuff, and a whole bunch more. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, some of the aforementioned network reminding you, if you like what you hear, not just for crypto, we see a lot of new listeners coming in from the crypto space into this program. Remember, there's a whole network out there. <laughs> You know, pretty much multiple times a day. So if you like what you hear for this show, you're going to like everything we do throughout the rest of the week, including a lot of you who are coming from the crypto space, maybe a little bit newer to the world of options, program like Options Bootcamp or Options Playbook Radio really help you get acclimated to these terms we're throwing around here on the show all the time, like skew and volatility and all these other fun things. There's pretty much a couple of shows hitting you a day on the network. So if you haven't done so already, I know a lot of you have. First off, upgrade to the full network. <laughs> You're going to get a lot more content. And then B, keep those reviews coming. It's more important than ever in these troubled times to give all these new additions to the options market and indeed to the crypto market a place to turn for a reliable source of information. So keep those reviews coming. It really does help new people discover the content all the time. Of course, keep those questions coming too. We do love to hear from you guys. And now let's see who we're going to hear from on the show this week. It is time to roll out the Crypto Hot Seat. Forget about cold storage. It's time to turn up the heat on thought leaders from the world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time to take their place on the, the Crypto, Crypto Hot, Hot Seat. Seat. All 
right, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto Hot Seat, the portion of the program where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of crypto derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. And today's guest is an old friend of the network, even though she hasn't been on in a little bit and her title may have changed a little bit since the last time we chatted with her. She is Janine Hightower Salito, now the chief executive officer over there at Atomize. Janine, welcome back to the Crypto Rundown program. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Well, as I mentioned there at the top of the program, a little bit of a change. The last time you were on with us was about six months ago. It was back in June of this year. And the last time you were on, you were beaming at us as the MD of operations over there at Gemini. So now a little bit of a change in the title over there, as well as a little bit of a change in firm. So so what's going on? Catch us up, Janine. What is Atomize and how did you come involved in it? Yeah, it's a crazy time to have been changing jobs in the midst of the pandemic. Um, I was surprised, um, actually, that the year ended up in such a different way than it started, not only from uh, the, the current events in, in the world today, but also from my role um, where I am at Atomize. So I, I took a new role in July of this year, uh, heading up uh, a CEO, a, a company called Atomize. We are a, uh, a fintech firm that's focused on um, financial services, industrial services for physical assets. And, and to dig into that a little bit deeper, uh, we are building out a platform uh, to tokenize and to allow for trading and transfer of digital assets um, that represent real world objects um, in, in our early product suite, um, which are going to mainly be um, precious and base metals. Um, but by tokenizing them, uh, basically creating um, a digital asset representing above ground, physical, fabricated uh, bars of metal sitting in vault and bringing the benefits of blockchain technology to make those uh, more accessible to investors at a better price and more efficiently and really innovating in that space all around. Now, that's one of the things I like about the crypto space in general is there's so many interesting areas to mine, pun intended, out there. Until you came on, I had never thought about uh, taking the world of physical metals in particular and making them accessible to the crypto trading world. Yeah, that's exactly what you're looking at there. What is it about the, the world of physical assets and bringing them into the modern digital landscape that, that really attracted you, Janine? So you know, I've spent a whole career really, you know, being at the beginning of a lot of things. Um, I was at the International Securities Exchange for a really long time, uh, almost 14 years. Uh, we really invented essentially what were the, the equity options markets in the U.S. Uh, we, we at the time brought super innovative technology um, forward and created an electronic market for trading options where only paper-based, manual-based trading existed. Uh, and, and through that history. I've seen how much technology can not only change how trades are done, but also create new markets where, where none existed before. Um, that business evolved in a way I don't think anyone dreamed about in the year 2000. Um, and I think we're going to see the same thing for in the, in the market for physical commodities. Um, there are um, some commodities that are pretty well served, but could be could benefit from better efficiency um, and, and reduce cost of transactions. And then there's other commodities that really don't have the type of investor access that we're hoping to bring to the market today. Um, if you think about products like um, palladium or, or um, cobalt or nickel, um, some of these products are really hard for investors to access. There, there's some products like futures that can be a little bit expensive in terms of the role that has to be maintained. Um, they're often complicated for customers to access, especially customers that aren't, you know, trading hundreds of millions of dollars of these assets. Um, and they're interesting products. They're, they're really products that we think customers, um, meaning investors, um, would have an, an opinion on. You know, if, if you're looking at, you know, for example, the electric vehicle market, and you have a view of where that market's headed over the next, you know, one year, two year, five years, and you think it's a great um, opportunity for, for investing in, you have equities for those uh, for some of those companies that are building these these vehicles you know Tesla et cetera but those those stocks are really noisy they, they have a lot of other um, drivers in the way that their price performance is maintained that's not really based on the actual production values of the cars um, that they're producing and so you know some of these raw materials that we're looking at and, and our focus is going to be in the early days metals but we hope to extend into a full range of commodities and physical assets um, but giving investors access to these markets 
in a cost efficient way, in a way that there can be real liquidity for both buying and, and selling those assets, um, providing the simplicity of, you know, logging onto a platform or, or going to, um, to a platform to be able to access them and not having to deal with um, actual taking delivery of them or having to manage storage. Um, there, there's a lot of efficiencies that can be brought. And then lastly, you know, in one area that we hope to extend into, um, because of, of blockchain technology, and it's really unique in this way, the, the ownership of the title is is in the contract. It's actually part of the contract itself. And so the customer is actually holding title to that actual specific bar sitting in a vault. And so, um, you know, there, there is no credit relationship. Um, so the customer is, is holding it. They're not a creditor of someone else holding the assets. Uh, and lastly, because you can actually write into the smart contracts some of the financing options, it should actually help um, trying to achieve some financing for purchases of these assets uh, as well. Well, you mentioned ISC. There certainly has been quite the uh, diaspora of former ISC people into the world of crypto. Of course, yourself first at Gemini, now over here at Atomize. Koppel, just on the network not too long ago, running Cross Tower over there. I do believe Boris has dabbled in a few crypto-related ventures as well. So I guess it shouldn't surprise me that uh, you ISC folks are knee-deep in crypto now, Janine. No, it's, it's not surprising at all. In fact, I think, you know, as um, the options business has matured, and there's been a lot of consolidation in that business, which is pretty, pretty natural thing to happen. Um, those of us that sort of, you know, picked up our heads and, and missed the entrepreneurial spirit of the early days of ISE and, and the great team we had over there have sort of sought out, um, you know, some greener pastures for, for innovation. And, and so my path has taken me to Gemini, um, you know, after, out of my, or sorry, after ISE, I ended up at Gemini um, working on um, uh, their custody platform and their exchange platform, you know, building out institutional grade infrastructure, you know, laying the groundwork, which I think we're seeing in the crypto space today for institutions coming in to those markets uh, and, and really, you know, being accepting of crypto, finding it to be a robust and mature marketplace, um, still, still maturing, but, but much more mature than it was a few years ago. Uh, and so really proud of the work that I had done at Gemini. Uh, and then, you know, again, this is, this is a great opportunity for me to really take something from the beginning uh, and put my stamp on it and extend our reach into a whole new asset class that, you know, frankly, you know, we see, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, those of us that have been in equities, um, you know, kind of look at other asset classes, whether it's fixed income, whatever it is. And, and we always kind of, you know, are amazed some of the inefficiencies that exist um, and, and hope to um, continue to march that forward towards progress. Well, speaking of inefficiencies, you, you picked a good marketplace in that segment when it comes to metals. You know, we've heard a lot of different complaints over the years by various metals traders, whether it's the futures, the options, or, or anywhere in between. There are about a variety of different issues, transporting, delivery, warehousing, and storing the actual physical assets. You always hear these horror stories about large chunks of supply just vanishing off the grid for a little bit of time as they're being moved from somewhere to somewhere else, and people disputing how much actually exists at one location at any given time. So is that what a attracted you to the metal side of it? You think this is really an area, that's an opportunity that's ripe for a little bit of more efficiency using the blockchain there, Janine? Absolutely. You know, when I, look, when I looked at the opportunity, it was compelling to me because of a couple of things. First, you know, where, where the markets are um, the widest in terms of the spread, right? There's often the most room for innovation just as sort of a, a data point. And so clearly there's a lot of room um, in these markets for improvement just, you know, at face value. But you look at the tools people are using, the settlement time, the tracking, the complexity related to inventory management, and all of that is really ripe for innovation. And I think that's where um, we will have a really big impact um, secondly, I think there's a lot of other things that we're going to bring to the market. Um, so there's, there's a couple other things, you know, one in terms of um, the way that obviously you know, most people in your program are familiar with blockchain is it's an immutable ledger that allows you to track um, information over time. And, you know, we hope to, as we move forward, to start to bring some of the green aspects of trading to market so that products that were otherwise fungible can actually be differentiated based on the environmental concerns, the labor standards. Um, you know, when you look at metals like cobalt, that there's huge um, concerns about labor practices in those types of metals, that you'll actually be able to, to trace individual parts of that inventory through ownership over time. And so that's something that I think will help differentiate the platform 
Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into um, transporting of material, um, what it's going to be used in a commercial perspective. We have um, a whole second work stream that um, will be coming to market later next year that's focused on the industrial side of the business, um, innovating with both um, industrial producers as well as commercial users of the material um, for um, being able to, to track their inventory, being able to um, create flexible contracts for both acquisition uh, and disposal of inventory. And again, in, in those types of um, contracts, you're actually able to include a lot of the, the metadata that goes into um, the actual material itself. And so I think it will see a whole new evolution, similar to the way we saw you know, evolution in the options markets. You know, once things are electronic, you can, you can really, you know, um, bring about different forms of trading, types of trading. There's new participants that enter. There's some that exit um, as well. And then, um, you know, you, you kind of have a whole different marketplace in, in many years' time. So I, I think we're going to really be anxious to see that evolution take place. We kind of touched on it there a little bit. Let's break it down a little bit more for our audience, exactly how the process works or is planned to work once all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed over there at Atomize. Uh, let's say I'm an existing you know, metals trader. I have an existing position sitting in, in Warehouse X. Now, I come to you guys as Atomize, and you use the blockchain to create effectively a, a digital contract, a token that represents that amount of my actual holding in the physical world, and I could trade it on your platform. Is that a very simplistic way of summing it up, Janine? You, you got it with, it with one little thing inserted in there. So someone that has a significant holding of metal, uh, it really could be any asset owner. It doesn't have to be a producer necessarily. It could be a trader um, or a commercial user. Um, the, the one thing that's there is that it has to be um, held um, so that atomized controls the inventory. Obviously, someone can't be selling the inventory they have while it's pledged to be part of a uh, tokenized contract. So atomized actually has to maintain the inventory as well as have our third party auditor come in and regularly attest to the fact that the inventory is there. It's the correct inventory. It matches what's been tokenized um, so that there's assurance uh, for both the uh, customer as well as atomized and, and for the, you know, the, the seller's benefit as well, that that inventory is actually there. But that's, that's essentially um, it. You know, there, if you have um, our, our first issuer will be Global Palladium Fund. Um, they're going to be doing a palladium issue. Um, we're targeting uh, end of Q2 of next year. Uh, that metal will be held in, in vault uh, in Atomize's name uh, with Atomize as the sole controller of being able to decide um, you know, where and when that metal can be dispersed from based on the instructions of our customers. Uh, that metal will be attested to um, by a third-party auditor, and then it will be tokenized. And then basically customers can come on the platform. They can buy um, – you know, one ounce of palladium, they can buy a fractional ounce of palladium, they can buy, you know, $10 million worth of palladium um, and actually have the physical title to that uh, in their name by way of the smart contract. Well, you've been involved in the early days of a few exchanges now, so you know that early process of getting a new exchange up and running is a bit of a catch-22. You want to go out there and attract market makers and order flow providers to the exchange, but they really don't want to come until there are customers there. But the customers don't want to come until there's liquidity, until there's tight markets. So it's a bit of forcing one or the other to the water and making them drink first. So, so how is that process? I know it's still early days over there at Atomize, but how is that process unfolding so far, Janine? Yeah, Mark, you know, that's, that's the fun stuff, right? You know, the fun stuff is figuring it all out. Um, this, this platform we're building is completely unique um, and novel, especially in this space. So um, so it, it's fun. There's a lot of challenges. Um, it, it's, of course, as you mentioned, um, getting supply on the platform. So we're very fortunate to have, um, you know, the support of Global Palladium Fund to issue not only our first product, but our first several products. Uh, in the metal space to get us up and running. Um, so, so we think we'll have really good liquidity from, from them as one of our initial liquidity providers. Um, you know, looking for customers, obviously, that are interested in these products and wanting to know more about it. So, so if you are a customer and, and you're interested in, in learning more about these opportunities, you know, ping us. We're at, we're at Atomize uh, with a Y-Z-E because you've got to have, you know, a, an interesting spelling as a, as a crypto fintech. Um, so atomize.com uh, to get in touch with us. But so that's definitely, you know, part of building that market. Um, you know, we're, we're making the rounds and talking to people in our early days to get ready for launch. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that go into building the platform itself. Obviously, there's the tech that's got to be built out, um, the regulatory aspects of the platform, you know, adhering to all of the, um, the practices. We're um, pursuing all of our MTLs right now, state by state. Uh, we are going to be pursuing a trust company license um, so our customers can feel secure 
uh, and doing business with us and, and understand that we're well regulated. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that goes into making sure um, we're ready and, and, you know, we're ready when we open our doors for business um, from a markets perspective and from a regulatory perspective. Well, we pride ourselves on getting people on the show early here so our listeners can uh, <laughs> can hear for themselves first before they hear about it at some other venue. But as you mentioned, there's still a lot of work to be done in getting uh, all the machinery up and running before you can really go out there and start onboarding these clients and these customers. So give us a ballpark. I know you mentioned the regulatory side. There's still a lot to be done there. There's, in your case, with the metals, the physical storage side and everything else to be worked out, the tech side. So what is your ballpark for when you think we uh, our listeners can come in as a customer and kick the tire? and atomize for themselves? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for, you know, realistically speaking, probably an early Q3 start. Um, I would be, be very um, optimistic that that's very possible. I was thinking maybe even a year or more beyond. So Q3, that isn't, uh, that isn't too yeah. bad given all the work you have to still do over there, Gene. And you mentioned the regulatory side. That's always a bit of a, a catch-22 as well in the crypto scene. How is that process unfolding? Are you optimistic that uh, this venture is going to pass muster? Because obviously here in the U.S., if you want to get big institutional players on board, they like to have their I's dotted and T's crossed, Janine. 100%. We fully recognize that the, the types of customers we're dealing with really need us to be very buttoned up. Um, they need us to have all our appropriate licensing. We, um, you know, my career has always been, you know, um, being on the right side of the regulatory front and, and at Atomize, it's no different. Um, we're working with our regulators. We're doing assessments of the types of licenses that we do need um, and, and asking first rather than, you know, trying to, to open up our um, our business and then figuring out what we need later. So we we definitely have been uh, immersed in our assessments with our outside counsel in terms of what licenses we need and going down that path. Um, so you know we're we're actually you know have found the environment to be extremely welcoming. I think we've seen this across the crypto landscape. You know in the in the past six months where everyone's eyes are open to the world changing and and there's a lot of appetite for learning. Uh, and working with us to, to you know, be well regulated and, and to, um, you know, follow the rules, work with the regulators, make sure we're doing all the appropriate KYC, uh, make sure that we have a robust platform from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, and and I, so I, I don't I don't think it's like the kind of environment where regulators are kind of, you know, please, please go away. We, we don't want to have to deal with you. I think they're actually saying this is a great opportunity to be um, to be working with a new company, doing something new and different. And how do we help them? Um, and at the same time, protect our constituents, make sure that they're following all the applicable laws and standards. And so we've been having a very good experience um, working and talking with regulators. And of course, you're launching this new venture in the teeth or hopefully, let's hope, the tail end of a pandemic. Now the vaccines are rolling out today as we speak, but also in the midst of the tail end of an election and now a transition in terms of administrations, which typically gums up the regulatory works. Any concerns, Janine, about launching this new venture, which would be challenging in a normal environment, but now on the tail end of not just a pandemic, but this changeover in administrations here? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, we are talking to, to state regulators, um, we, you know, we are talking to federal regulators. There's a lot that has to go into making decisions on the path we're going to go down. And look, anytime there's um, a national election, things are changing. There's different appointments in Washington. There'll be different regimes. You know, equities is no, no different um, than, than commodities. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely, you know, eyes to the horizon of what might be coming forward. I um, mean, you know, we've been paying attention to the Stable Act. You know, there, there's lots of things that are, you know, percolating in the distance that we're going to have to pay attention to and adapt to over time. Um, but I think all in all, you know, the, the obviously the election year, the pandemic has had, you know, a, a huge impact, um, not only on overall volatility, but people's interest in crypto and digital assets. Um, I think one of the things that's been the most interesting is that there really has been sort of this um, maturation in, in the institutional investor landscape and sort of an appetite for alternatives. You know, if it's um, if it's Bitcoin, if it's other tokenized assets, I think people are sort of seeing the value of what digital assets can bring. And so I think net net, it's definitely been a positive for um, thinking about launch for next year because I think people are seeing institutional investors come into these markets with big names. I mean, you know, like Paul Tudor Jones, Stanley Druckenmiller, you know, BlackRock, Square, PayPal, Fidelity. I mean, they're, they're huge names that the MicroStrategy, you know, purchase. I mean, it, it's kind of incredible that this has all been, you know, waterfalling us ahead. Um, and I think we're, I don't want to say we're kind of following that because we're not necessarily following, but we're part of that same concept that there is um, 
uh, more efficient and better ways to bring value to investors that isn't necessarily um, you know, the traditional methods. And so I think we're, we're going to be really in a great position for a mid-2021 launch for our products. I think there, there will be a lot of interest and acceptance of um, this type of title for a physical asset. Well, Janine, I'm glad you could take a break from spinning up this platform to give our listeners a bit of an early glimpse into what you're working on over there at Atomize. And before we go, maybe if you want to leave our audience with a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease of what they can expect from you guys, or maybe you want to let them know if they want to learn more information, where they should go, what they should do. Now is the time, Janine. The floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you. Um, love to have the floor. So, yeah, I know there's so much going on here. But for, from your listener perspective, I think they're going to see you know a, a new paradigm coming out for trading some of these physical assets that are going to be much more inclusive, um, you know, be much more accessible to, to investors. Um, so look out for products on platinum, palladium, nickel, copper, cobalt, um, you know, precious metals as well. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to come live and be interested in hearing from them. And so if they want to find out more or stay in touch, um, look us up at atomize.com, um, A-T-O-M-Y-Z.com, and we'd love to hear from them. Yep, check them out, atomize.com. Don't forget that cool crypto slash web 2.0 spelling, A-T-O-M-Y-Z-E, to learn more. And Janine, I appreciate you coming on the show. We'll keep an eye on all this and look forward to a launch of Atomize sometime next year. Great. It's always a pleasure, Mark. Great talking to you and great having all you guys tuning in to join us as we keep on rolling into our next segment. It is time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trading activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the Bitcoin Breakdown. All right, everybody. That music means it is time for the Bitcoin Breakdown, the portion of the show where we break down all the action in the world's leading crypto asset. Yep, I'm talking about good old Bitcoin, a.k.a. the big dog. And in another comparatively quiet week show to show here a little bit of vacillation obviously in between but net coming into showtime now we saw bitcoin at the end of our last show was just north of the 19,000 level about 1943 i think it had broken through 1900 by the end of the show and coming in to start of today's show was at 19185 so puts, puts it up about 140 or so handles uh, from where it was at the start of the show last week. So if you've been paying attention to Bitcoin at all, you know that's not a heck of a lot of net movement. We've seen big swings. We've seen 3,000 handle intraday swings of late, but net on the show, not so much. You know all this data coming at you courtesy of our friends over there at Genesis Volatility, a.k.a. GVOL. Always firing up cool new tools over there, including some interesting ways now to compare and contrast skew amongst the different platforms. Pretty new stuff. Check it out if you're intrigued. You're listening to a show like this, so I'm guessing you probably are, including interesting ways to break it down hour by hour, which is an interesting new metric we've started to incorporate into uh, the show here. And that hourly vol on Bitcoin, you know, it peaked back at the beginning of the month, peaked on December 1st at about a 91. Uh, Last show was about 67%, and coming into today's show is at a little bit less, about 63, almost 64%. So obviously still very volatile, 60-plus percent in any major asset. There's a lot of volatility, but well off its peak it hit just earlier this month. Remember, they also look at skew a little bit differently over there at Genesis. They look at it as a more of a strip, the 30-20% strip as opposed to just a 25 delta call 25 delta put and you look at it in that perspective that peaked back in bitcoin at about 27 and a half on november 30th so a lot of interest and shall we say one end of the curve (laughs) Uh, over there last show it was about 11 so we had to come off quite a bit and this show has come off a little bit since then as well down to about nine and three quarters or so in terms of oi you know it keeps threatening that $5 billion level when you add it up across all the major platforms, so your Deribit, your back, your CME, and everything else out there. But then it retreats as the weekly expirations roll off the board. And the same thing happened this week. We saw it threatening $5 billion, then coming off, and threatening $5 billion, then coming off. And coming at showtime, it was threatening $5 billion again. Uh, Deribit still in the lead at about $3.9 billion. Then we've got, it looks like CME and OKEX still vying for number two, CME just ever so slightly edging them out at about $261 million in terms of notional now for number two. And then OKEX right behind them, 
$254 million. And then Ledger X, they're, actually, I take that back, Bic.com, edging them both out, $291 million. So uh, there we go. <laughs> and then, of course, a Ledger X at about $100 million even. Uh, so that puts it all coming in here at a little bit north of $4.5 billion out there. It's not quite $5 billion, but threatening it. As these, as the OI continues to grow, looking at that OI right now, it still is call heavy, even though puts are doing a fair bit of action out there as well. Calls leading the dance coming into showtime. 126,000 net OI in terms of all the different months added together are on the call side. Puts at about 79,000 out there. In terms of volume, let's look at the big dog. Let's look at Darabit. Overall, again, kind of in keeping with the underlying, not having the most active of weeks, the options. Didn't have the most active of weeks as well. The most active day was actually on Sunday, the 13th, so yesterday, with about $442 million worth of notional. Again, that's a decent amount of paper, but a far cry from what we've seen on the show not too long ago. End of November, we saw $750 million and then $600 million repeatedly, $700 million a couple of times early in November. So now $442 million. Not a lot compared to those, but still a decently active week. Every other day, though, this week was a lot less. You're talking 100-odd million, 200 million worth of notional going up. So not the most active of weeks out there on the crypto front. Not reflected in the options activity out there on Darabit. OI, hour by hour. They also break it down hour by hour over there at Genesis as well, which is kind of fascinating. That peaked at about 225000 uh, that was on Darabit. That's back on the 27th of November, uh, almost our last show. The 4th, a little bit before our last show of December. It hit 217,000. Last show was about 192,000. And now it actually has ticked up again, like I mentioned. It's about 203,000 contracts open over there on Darabit right now. In terms of the action today, not a lot lighting it up. Looks like the predominance of the paper on Darabit. Not quite a half, about 40%. It's like on the call selling side of the ledger out there today in terms of where the action is across the board breaking it down by month and indeed out in some of the weeklies as well you know crypto likes a quarterly bitcoin is no exception the dec contract is dominating the tape right now with about seventy-five thousand contracts open over there on dara but even though the weeklies are doing a decent amount of paper as well the dec contract expiring on the 18th has about thirty thousand contracts open right now and then the end of month, March has almost 50,000, about 47,000. Then we go out to March, has almost 30,000 out there. So decent March, the two quarterlies, taking up the, most of the oxygen out here. And let's go to the strikes. You know what strikes are dominating it. It's still that 36,000 strike. <laughs> That's still the big dog. About 20,000 contracts open almost exactly on that strike. So that order is still open. That person out there, who whether they wanted risk management, whether they wanted speculation, pick your poison on what they were actually up to out there. I think the risk management side makes a wee bit. If you can make sense out of this trade, that makes a little bit more sense in terms of opening up some units to trade some other things. Either way, that trade still on, that strike still open and open for size. The 20,000 strike number two now with a paltry by comparison, 15,000 contracts open on that strike. And then the 16,000 strike right behind it with about 14,700. So 16,000 and 20,000 in terms of the relevant strikes are really neck and neck. And then, of course, the outlandish 36,000 strike still open for size out there as well as the 52,000 strike. (laughs) So there are some interesting upside strikes open, but in terms of relevance, it's the 20,000 and the 16,000. We keep vacillating between those two extremes out there of late. Let's go on out to the Bitcoin land on CME right now, see what's been lighting it up. Hasn't been a rock'em sock'em week out there as well, which I think is pretty much what you could expect. Looks like the most active day was Friday with about 168 contracts. Remember, that's a 5x contract out there, so a bit of a multiplier at play. And Monday is about 105. Most of the rest of the days were 100 contracts or less. Of course, CME has been breaking it down. They had a pretty good quarter when it comes to all things crypto out there, as you probably could expect, given the action and the volatility. They've been crunching the numbers since launch. 34,000 Bitcoin options have traded. And they they look at OI spread out across 65 strikes with about 21% right now, they say, aggregated on the 20,000 strike out there, which again, makes more sense than the 36,000 strike we were just talking about. Futures-wise, same deal. Uh, November was a strong month at CME for the futures as well. Their ADV hit about 11,000, almost 11,500 contracts, which is about 57,000 equivalent uh, Bitcoin. That's up 
pretty much more than 100%, about 118% from this time uh, last year. Daily OI, about 11,700. That's up 17%. And 6,300 unique active accounts have traded since the launch, 64% more than this time last year. In terms of net volume this week, not a lot going on on the futures front on CME either. About 6,000 coming into the showtime today. Last week, pretty much every day was 8,000 or less. So not exactly a rock'em, sock'em, robots week out there on CME. Same thing for our friends at Backed Land. They had 824 contracts on the tape, according to our friends over there at the Backed Volume. That's down about 44%. Remember, they hit some decent numbers back earlier this year. September 17th, they hit their high of 18,000. 718. The 824 on the tape uh, for this breakdown, not so much, a wee bit less. So still waiting for the numbers to turn around out there in Backland as we turn the show around into our next segment. It is time to explore the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the The altcoin Altcoin universe. universe. All right, everybody, let's do it. Let's dive on into the other products trading outside of all things Bitcoin. Let's look at the top 10 first. Number 10, Binance Coin at about $4.3 billion. Number 9, Polkadot, $4.3 billion as well. Number 8, Cardano, $4.8 billion. Number 7, Bitcoin Cash at about $5 billion even. Number 6, Chainlink, a little bit north of $5 billion. Number 5, Litecoin, $5.3 billion. Number 4, Tether. At about 19, just a little bit shy of 20 billion. Number three, XRP, uh, giving up the ghost again, down to about 22.4 billion, but still, still good enough for number three. Still a little bit north of our old friend Tether there. Number two, of course, ETH, 66.5 billion. Number one, the big dog, Bitcoin, 355 billion. Still a far cry from what some of our guests were looking for on recent shows out there. The one trillion level, not quite there. But uh, an interesting week, nonetheless. Let's go on out to the number two product out there, ETH. Taking a bit of a break this week as well. Not much, so off about three and a half handles from where it was this time last show. So last show is at about 588. Come in, today's show is almost 585, 584 and change. Let's go back on out to the Genesis platform. Look at some of the hourly metrics that catch our eye. The one-hour vol out there in ETH, it peaked at about a 107. That was back at the end of November, November 23rd. I uh, hit 103 not too long ago, back on the 1st of December. And then our last show last week, it had come in quite a bit. Obviously, it was down to about 77.5%. And it's still right around that level today, about 76% coming into showtime. Same thing with the SKU, 30-20 SKU. That peaked on the 1st of December, hit almost 30 as we saw kind of uh, an ETH options palooza out there. Last show, it had come in quite a bit, down to about 13 and three quarters. And this show coming in a little bit more, down to about 7.5 right now. In terms of OI, where the action is in ETH, the OI is actually a lot more even in terms of calls versus puts in ETH than it is in Bitcoin. It's not quite as call heavy out there. Coming into showtime, we saw about 656,000 contracts open. And again, this is on Deribit, the main venue, followed by about 621,000 puts. So puts and calls pretty neck to neck out there. Not quite as unidirectional in terms of love and calls as it is in bitcoin let's look at the oi hour by hour that peaked at about 1.4 million on november 27th hit about 1.35 million on the 4th of december our last show is a little bit north of 1.2 million and it's still north of 1.2 million right now so not as much evolution on the eth oi front as we saw out there on bitcoin same deal from a volume perspective friday was the big day about 60 million worth of notional going up on dare but every other day last week Pretty much 55 million or less. So nothing blowing the doors out there from an overall uh, interest perspective. Let's, let's look at the open interest right now, see where the action is. Similar story to Bitcoin. December leading the dance. The end of month, December, has about 618,000 contracts open in it. So that's where most of the OI by far is hanging its hat right now in ETH, followed by March with about, looks like about almost 25,000 open than everything else pretty much a pale shadow it's all dees and then a little bit of march and then just a smattering of everything else kind of thrown in there if you're wondering where the strike action is unlike bitcoin which seems to like itself some outlandish strikes not so much on the eth front these are actually in the money strikes that are still dominating the uh, the oi right now with about the 400 strike has about seventy five thousand contracts open for number one followed pretty closely by the 320 strike 
with about 71 thousand contracts open so both of those pretty substantially in the money like i said we're coming into showtime at about 584 and a half right now in ETH. so from at least from a call perspective deep in the money (laughs) on those bad boys let's go on out now to ripple uh giving up quite a bit of the ghost (laughs) from our last show remember coming into our last show we saw our old friend xrp was north of 60 cents, ever so slightly, 60.1 cents. Giving up pretty much over a dime of that this week. Coming in this show now at 49 cents. So all you XRP bulls who hoped maybe this was it, this was the start of perhaps a new era out there in XRP. At least this week, not so much. Back down to 49 cents. So not exactly not exactly holding up at those levels. I know a lot of folks, again, were excited about that. But again, we'll see what next week Brings hopefully a little bit more price action to the upside will mean a little bit more action from an options perspective out there in ETH. Right now, the underlying is still pretty much an option. Uh, So not a lot of options activity to parse, but hopefully we'll see that change. One of these days out there, Bitcoin Cash also taking a break this week, down 13.1 from our last show. And Bitcoin SV down a little north of 12, about 12 and a quarter from last show. Now it's time to wrap it up a little bit of your crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody. Welcome to your crypto question segment. This week, we got some love here. Looks like coming from Jeff. Jeff Neal says, hey, guys. Well, hey, Jeff. Just me right now. So no guys, plural. But I'll take it nonetheless. Love the show and loving the crypto rundown. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's a great addition to the network. Starts my week off right with a glimpse into a market that I didn't previously understand or follow. Now I've actually started a crypto trading account. Mostly spot, but I'm waiting for more options to get approved before I dive in there. Those CME contracts are still too beefy for me. Thanks again for all that you do. You're welcome, Jeff. And thank you for taking the time and everyone else who took the time to write in, listen to the show, listen live, of course. Leave those reviews on your platform of choice. We have seen just an amazing influx of new people coming into this show and indeed all the shows on the network these days. So as much as you guys thank us, we want to turn around and thank you guys as well. And your story actually is not unique, Jeff. We've heard a lot of people write in with similar thoughts out here saying they've started to get turned on to the world of crypto and indeed the derivatives by listening to this show. And also a lot of them also saying, yeah, maybe the stuff at CME is still a little bit beefy for their needs, as you put it. But you're not alone in that sense. The 5X contract is a little bit much for some people. So they're waiting for more venues to get up and running, get approved here in the U.S. Obviously, a lot of the big ones we talk about, like Deribit, still not really viable for most of our U.S. audience here. So they're waiting for something else to come along that they could really sink their teeth into. But in the meantime, like you, they have been experimenting with the spot and learning a little bit more about these markets. So I'm glad to hear You've been uh, turned to the dark side there, Jeff, and everyone else out there who shared similar sentiments, and we'll look forward to hearing more from you guys in the coming weeks. All right. That music means we've come to the end of this episode of the Crypto Rundown. I want to thank Janine from Atomize for joining us, giving us a very early glimpse. You'll love to get some stuff before you guys have heard of it here on the show to give you guys a chance to sink your teeth into it and mull it over. Have you ever thought about digitizing the world of physical commodities like metals. Certainly an area that is ripe for a little bit of disruption and ripe for a little bit of, shall we say, improving of efficiency out there. So sounds like the folks at Atomize are going to do just that. If you want to check them out, of course, Atomize, A-T-O-M-Y-Z-E, Atomize.us to learn more. And of course, while you're clicking around in the crypto space, head on over there to the folks at Genesis Vol, a.k.a. GVOL. Check them out. GenesisVolatility.io is a place to go. Sign up for that trial of their pro tools. You can see all the stuff we're talking about and a lot more over here, the hour-by-hour stuff, the skew, comparing and contrasting different platforms. They literally add a new feature pretty much every time we do this show, so it's a lot to keep up with, but I think you guys are going to love it. Genesis Volatility. Io is the place to go. And on behalf of Janine and our friends over there, Genesis MD, myself, I thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live, for keeping the questions and the love coming. We love to hear from you guys. And we'll see you back here tomorrow, Interview Tuesday, Education Wednesday, the Option Block, and Twifo on Thursday, Ball Views on Friday. Then it all kicks off again next week with another episode of the Crypto Rundown. 
This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit gvol.io. That's G V O L dot I O. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 